If you have any comments or questions during the program, you can please write them down in the chat and we will get back to the, them later. There will be also specific points for discussion and you can please raise your hand to speak and we will open your mic for you. And now that the practical matters are done, welcome to this webinar on micro-credentials and open education. I'm Tiina Parkkonen, a project manager for innovative pedagogy and lifelong learning at the Ingenium European University. It's my pleasure uh, to welcome Ana Isabel Alvarez Gonzalez, the director of Ingenium European University, to open this webinar. Welcome, Ana. Um, thank you. Just let me check that I've got my microphone on. Um, yeah, it is on. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Tina. So welcome, everyone. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all. Right. And uh, also to have this webinar here that we are recording for everyone else to maybe watch later on and, and, and to learn from it. Right. So, uh, of course, I'd like to start by saying thank you. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Kai. Thank you, all the colleagues who will be presenting today, uh, Michael, George. Right. Um, um, thank you for all your contributions to, to our work in, these, in this area of micro-credentials. Uh, and of course, thank you for inviting me to share these welcome greetings with you all to participate. Um, because this will give me the, the opportunity to continue to learn and to share with you all about this um, quite crucial aspect for the development of the um, Ingenium European Alliance and the Ingenium European Campus. Um, well, in fact, we're all well aware that as current societies are facing an unprecedented number of changes, disruptive changes and transformations, these um, societies of, of today, they call for an updated understanding of teaching and learning processes, of lifelong learning, um, which is not anymore an option, but rather a necessity for us all. And micro credentials are not only a way to respond to, to these uh, fast evolving challenges and, and training needs, but also an opportunity to innovate with different train, training formats and pedagogies as they actually constitute a perfect tool to respond to demands from industry, from society at large. Um, and they do not serve um, only to, to provide solutions that are helpful to the different societal actors, right? Uh, uh, in fact, um, they, oops, I'm sorry, I've got a little bit of a problem here with my computer. Yeah, I've got some messages jumping in. I'm sorry, I was I was saying that, uh, um, uh, in fact, uh, they will not only serve to provide solutions that are helpful to the different societal actors, but also um, to devise accurate training models through direct co-creation um, with them. And, and for Ingenium, for our lines, um, micro-credentials are at the very core of our goals across different areas. Uh, we strongly believe that the great diversity of our alliance can be the perfect match for these innovative and flexible type of opportunities. And uh, well, this is reflected in our kind of dual approach to micro credentials within the Alliance as ele elements of lifelong learning on the one hand and as uh, flexible learning pathways for general students on, on the other hand. So um, on one hand, as I was saying, micro credentials for lifelong learning will allow Ingenium to provide uh, targeted educational opportunities that are useful for employability, for innovation, for inclusion, as we seek to help people from all backgrounds to benefit from our transnational uh, alliance and our transnational approach to education. And by pulling together our resources and building on our different respective strengths, uh, we can be more effective, more efficient and more impactful in responding to these needs of society in creating more and better opportunities that, uh, than those that we would be creating if we were to act separately as individual universities. And on the other hand, as I was saying, with the creation of flexible and customized learning pathways for students, uh, we, in Genium, we aim at using micro-credentials to help students co-design their own learning experiences in higher education through more 
open degrees that will allow, the, allow them to combine components from different engineering institutions, different, academic, different academic, uh, academic disciplines, and therefore um, uh, make the curriculum much richer. So to do this, we have in the Alliance committed ourselves to the creation of a joint pool of micro-credentials that students will be able to incorporate into their study programs. Actually, the deliverable that is about to completely be completed now, this deliverable called the engineering micro-credentials and materials, uh, together with the progress of the rest of uh, work packages and workloads in the Alliance, will um, help us pave the way towards uh, this objective. So we have clear and ambitious objectives on this side. Um, and um, we need to write, uh, uh, approach uh, the pathway towards uh, uh, these objectives in um, uh, a number of manners that include basically cooperation and continuous support, right? So in this webinar, we have a good example of this approach to, during today's session. We will learn about the different resources, the different processes, the different tools that Ingenium is building to um, make our micro credentials uh, and uh, uh, we will uh, uh, actually right uh, be learning uh, from each other as we as we always do um, we will be exploring the different ways in which engineering partners can cooperate and build on their experiences to co create sorry to create this uh, micro credentials offer Right, uh, quite shortly. Um, and, and the beautiful thing that we are particularly happy about is that we will not be doing this alone, of course. Um, we will be able to learn directly from the very enriching experience of one other uh, alliance, a great alliance such as ECIU, who's kindly joining us here today, represented by Professor Henry uh, Perkalainen, right? Uh, and uh, I'm sure we will greatly benefit from their experience and from the uh, orientation right toward our aims. Uh, because, of course, um, Ingenium strongly believes in the potential of cooperation among alliances. And we are really thankful and really thrilled to, to have you um, with here us today, um, Henry. So um, I'm sure that all the enriching discussions that will arise today will help us improve even further in our micro credentials our strategy uh, and um, make our community uh, more and um, so more um, strong than it is nowadays. So once again, thank you very much for having me here today, Tina. Thank you, Kai. Thank you, everyone who has worked on this webinar uh, and on the microbudacials uh, strategy at large. Um, Special thanks to somebody who is actually not here today, but who will be watching us a bit later, uh, our strategic manager, Juan Rajon, for his assistance in the preparation of the, ses the session and for his commitment to all the tasks and all the processes what, that we are um, developing uh, to ensure um, success right uh, in um, this pathway toward a solid engineering academic offer. So I'm really looking forward to learning from you all to listening to your presentations to uh, sharing knowledge with you all thank you and i'm sure this will be a very fruitful uh, experience thanks thank you anna for your kind and encouraging words it's wonderful to go and proceed now this great program next we have the pleasure to welcome henry pirkkalainen professor of information and knowledge management Wait. Yes, thank you. And Henry is coming from ECIU Alliance, and he will be speaking today about exploring micro credentials at ECIU definition, best practices, and digital verification. The floor is yours, Henry, please. Thank you, Tina, and thank you so much for the invitation to this to this webinar. Uh, so yeah, my name is Henry Pirkkalainen. and I'm uh, I work in Tampere University, but for five years now, uh, I've been very much connected to the ECI University Alliance. And um, in the first four years, we were really exploring, you know, that was when the first European University Alliances were were uh, uh, emerging. Uh, we were really looking to this concept of micro-credential. And, and I think we had a quite also, let, let's just say, a rocky road, but 
I think there are now very also good outcomes in the in the last few years in in the ETA University. So I'll try to raise some of the best practices that we've identified, but also like acknowledging some of the challenges that they they lie in this kind of a new new topic such as micro credentialing. So uh, currently I'm leading the micro credential platform and learner guidance activities in ETH University and in the first four years I was leading the micro credential work package itself. So um, yeah if you aren't aware of ETH University it's basically an alliance of 14 university. Um, it has this kind of a um, strategic focus on challenge-based learning that's kind of a signature approach of ECA University so that learners basically come together from different universities uh, like set up set up teams uh, with, it, with each other and try to solve some of the real life problems and foster change so that's kind of a, the significant uh, signature pedagogy that we have and from the start the focus was very much on micro credentialing and when we started in 2019 uh, the European Commission hadn't yet come up with the uh, the recommendation for micro credentials we, which also made our life a bit easier because uh, we always had like a big like let's say lots of confusion in the between the partners and in the alliance on what do micro credentials actually consist of so uh, we really also like align with this European Commission's definition that micro credential is the record of learning outcomes for the learner has acquired following a small volume of learning, which has been assessed against a transparent and clearly defined criteria. So it's something that we we align with, but uh, one of the kind of a key things has been in ECIU to kind of, a, especially in the first four years, we had a lot of trouble in a way because everyone understands micro credentials slightly in a different manner. Sometimes, you know, when you discuss micro credentials, people might think about like this kind of a more of the kind of an outcome, the kind of a, the record, the verification that you get from the learning activity. And sometimes it's more about the learning activity or learning opportunity itself. So a particular course and its content and learning outcomes and how to kind of a keep the discussion about the quality aspects, the design aspects in a way that uh, that we can respect basically the both. So we had to do quite a lot of work also to kind of a separate the wording in, in such sense so that when we talk about micro credentials that we aren't talking about potatoes and oranges, but hopefully we, we like utilize the, the terms that uh, the original terms, for instance, of the learning opportunities and then the actual digital credential that you might come get as, uh, as an outcome to bring some consistency and clarity to, to the discussions. Uh, in ECIU, the, the basic idea is that we have this um, this uh, learning platform called Engage, uh, where we have two kinds of learning opportunities. So as mentioned, there's this kind of a signature approach for the challenge based learning with some of you. Uh, I think it's quite close to like, for instance, like problem and project based learning, but has some slight differences in the in the approach. But the basic idea is that it's very team oriented and quite often quite open ended problem solving. Um, this is something that differentiates a bit from the micro modules that ECIU offers. So um, from the start with we identified that there's probably a need for some kind of a more smaller modules of learning that people could also individually up, like uptake and, and accomplish. So at the start of you know that was maybe in 2020 easier you kind of made the decision that we kind of want to connect quite much with the faculties of the partner institutions and to the especially master's level programs so micro modules in many cases are derived from existing curricula so that's probably one of the opportunities that ECIU has had but also the source of many challenges that ECIU also has for micro credentialing and and also for um, you know encompassing aspects of lifelong learning when you are catering from something that is more traditional way of, of uh, education but while doing that uh, ECA you kind of set certain thematic areas to focus on and started this curation of of, of basically ECA use learning opportunities Many of them in the process have been co-created by partners of ECIU that they are not just like uh, existing courses as such. 
they ra range in the amount of ECTS, but this aspect of ECTS has been critical from the start with to foster actually activity of the learners that they do also see the value of it and also to better align with the, this micro credential activities in the higher education context so that we are also uh, compatible with this kind of a recognition of learning in general. In ECIU uh, currently, like when we think about this engaged platform, that it, it's something that caters for the ECIU partner universities. Um, at the start, the, of course, the ambition was very, very uh, like a high in order to cater for lifelong learners from the start. But there are again different rules, you know, that come into play when we are like uh, developing something kind of a also related much to the faculties of the partner institutions. So that's something that the lifelong learning uh, in many ways requires a different way of kind of a building the the learning opportunities and and to cater for them. So that's a kind of a separate activity currently and under investigation, how do we best combine these approaches? We also like uh, lean very much to the engage platform that I mentioned is that it's a separate environment from our partner institutions learning management systems. It's separate from the student information systems that we have nationally onboarded, which again sets challenges and opportunities in a way that we can, of course, design many of the tools, uh, tool sets and services that we build for the environment. But at the same time, whether the pipelines are there from the, our existing systems is that brings some kind of a level of complexity to the to the thing. And then when we think about these learning opportunities, micro credentials for us in many ways refer to the actual record of the learning that the learner gets. So that's something that uh, I think kind of is represented by the uh, the kind of at the paper versus something in, in digital is that we, I think we're seeing a kind of a larger, like let's say a digital transformation also in, in higher education that it's not anymore about the kind of a paper certificates and something that can be easily like falsified and something that are just in your cupboard somewhere, but it's more about you yourself, the learning that you have accumulated and the things how you can proof of who you are, what your competencies are, and so on. So in a similar way that nowadays we're thinking about how to digitalize, for instance, the kind of a transcript of records and your basically a master's degree, uh, we talk about with micro credentials more about the kind of a, the smaller volumes of learning and how to capture those proofs. And we align quite much with this, uh, this uh, European digital credential uh, platform and especially the kind of a proofs and certificates that the learner can then accumulate, for instance, on their own Europass wallet. So we started quite early on to experiment with EU's this EDC environment and to kind of a, see a transition from this flat, simple papers to more uh, verifiable uh, digital credentials that the learner actually owns. So something that is like fulfills the uh, some of the key criteria for, that come from the European Commission's recommendation on micro-credentialing. So what we have now done in the last couple of years is that the micro-credentials learners do get from all ECIU learning opportunities. And I think this was one of the biggest, let's say, uh, uh, moments for ECIU when we made this a reality something like less than a year ago. So basically what it means that if when the learners are like uh, completing some of those ECIU micro models or ECIU challenges is that they are being issued this micro credential to their Europe as wallet after the successful completion. And that happens centrally from our engaged platform. It doesn't happen from the OK partner institution might, of course, uh, issue some similar verifications from their home universities. But we identified uh, already three years ago that partners uh, progress on these technical areas at the very different speeds. And it's also a strategic question for them whether they want to go for, for instance, this uh, micro credentials to the Europass wallet, whether that's something that they, is in their radar at all. So we felt that it's uh, important for us to do this more or less centrally in a way that uh, you get that kind of a verifiable 
uh, digital credential to your Europass wallet, no matter what. So I think that's an important step in micro credentialing. And simultaneously, what we want to offer is that because we have this Europe, uh, this Engage platform, is that we want to build different types of flexible learning pathways in that environment. So depending on what the learner has accomplished, what competencies they have gathered, is that that information is then being utilized to provide, we hope, more accurate uh, gui guidance for the learner of what they could study next and to find learning opportunities that are helpful for them. So we are building on different types of tools and strategies, also artificial intelligence related aspects in order to build those flexible learning pathways. So uh, I'll try to kind of have, because this is a short presentation, so I, I cannot go to all areas in very deeply, but I'll try to distill some of the kind of a best practices in terms of kind of a do's and don'ts that, that I, I felt that something that we have struggled with quite a bit and overcome to some extent, so that hopefully this can also help you in your decision making at Ingenium and in related um, alliances. So first of all, what we have found really, really helpful is to assign different types of task forces to kind of uh, examine different aspects of micro credentials and to do this overlapping, of course, but still that to have particular kind of a know how in different areas. For instance, these technical areas like what kind of a platforms do you utilize? But at the same time, there are a lot of legal uh, considerations. So the way that you are maybe issuing these micro credentials or where you are, uh, uh, let's say, compiling or s documenting some information, it might have some legal and GDPR and similar considerations. So I think it was really helpful to have this kind of a team that kind of looks into this kind of aspects uh, at, at all points. And one thing is, of course, to operational operationalize things. So I think this kind of a how to kind of a scale this from one partner to another and something on an alliance level is that this operational thing uh, requires lots of attention. We also have found out that the learning opportunities, this kind of a curation, more or less similarly, I mean, I do, wouldn't want to use the term curricula, but still like it, to think in a way of how, how do we, what kind of a makes a good and valuable whole in terms of those learning opportunities. So what what kind of a combination of them is meaningful and that the learners would appreciate. So I think this kind of a curation and that it's continuous and it's strategic. That's something that works for your alliance and something that your partners ac can accept. And, and align with. I think that's that's really, really essential. Um, one thing that I think many of the alliances, us, us included, ECA, you have kind of had a hard time in identifying what's the difference between experimenting and being able to fail instead of just like thinking about scaling up from the start with. Uh, when we talk about micro-credentials, we are talking about rather new innovation itself and in as in all innovations that things change and things might change very rapidly so i think this kind of a scaling decisions of scaling to for instance 14 partners in eciu it's definitely not the right way in all all kind of a steps because the we don't know the things that we don't know i mean many uh re recommendations for micro credentials the platforms around them, uh, how they are designed, quality aspects, they might change, of course, as more people are uh, occupying this space. So I think one key thing is really to experiment and being able to also fail in those experiments, because that's where many of the lessons learned come from. Um, I think one, one uh, clear thing is that the, there's not one size fits all approach for micro credentials. So it's quite likely that in an alliance is that something that works for a particular university, particular types of study programs and areas might not work for an alliance. So that there's kind of a needs to be a balance between uh, what an alliance does and what partners are doing in institutionally. I mean, if, if, if you started to match too much of this, I think there are many problems arise, but 
Of course, similar, similarly, there needs to be some kind of a commonality between, between doing things that, that the alliance is uh, able to push through some uh, new grounds. One thing is this kind of a recognition agreements, recognition accord that, uh, that if you feel that the EU tools aren't sufficient, for instance, for recognition of micro credentials. And I think this is something that can really help. Um, and then for the don'ts, I don't have too many. I'll try to wrap up very soon is that I think it's clear that partner institutions, you know, different universities, uh, applied sciences, uh, um, let's say consulting companies and, and maybe institutions that are adopting micro credentials, all of them progress at the different pace and not necessarily to the same direction. So I think it's fair to kind of assume that partners in an alliance uh, have interest for micro credentials at the varying level in varying time points in time. So I think it's better not to always think that let's wait that everyone's on board and then move on. Um, I think this is one of the key things is that when discussing micro credentials, uh, we try to often in many meetings avoid or ban the use of the term micro credentials. So let's talk about what we're actually considering. Are we talking about the learning opportunity? Uh, are we sometimes talking more about this digital credential and the proof that the learner gets? And to really focus the discussion about quality criteria and similar the design aspects, particularly for separately, and then think about where we can align them, but kind of avoid using bus terms where people might not have exactly the same understanding. And I think there was there will always be a kind of a some kind of a trade off when working in an alliance so that the, what is a kind of a perfect outcome for you in terms of micro credentialing. I think there will be different types of trade offs. For instance, in ECI, you building from, let's say, uh, faculties and having a separate uh, platform where things reside is that there are naturally some things that might not be a very good fit for lifelong learnings from the, from the start with, and that there are maybe some technical issues when uh, trying to kind of uh, put the data to flow from one partner institution's uh, environment to the central one. So I think there are these kind of lessons learned that have to be considered. Um, if you're interested to read some of the our, our road for the micro credentials, we have this kind of a more or less annual micro credential white papers. And from the ECIU website, the, in the news, uh, there's this fourth micro credential white paper that you can, uh, that the um, uh, the uh, work package leader Mairead has, has put together from DCU. So maybe have a look if you have time. And I think maybe we have a couple of more minutes for some uh, questions and comments. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Henry, for your presentation. It was amazing to see what you have been doing in your alliance and you have been doing kind of pioneering, pioneering work in your alliance. And now we have little time for questions for Henry and EZIU. And there are participants who don't have the rights to immediately answer the questions. So please raise your hand and we can uh, unmute you. Okay, Eva Kuoppala, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for your interesting and, and extremely useful presentation. I work here at Taksamk as the engineering project director. And uh, I was wondering that, uh, how do you see the relationship between micro-credentials and open, uh, digital open patches? How, ha how have you defined that? That's a really good question. And, and I think it's uh, kind of a, the con maybe the differences change over the years quite rapidly. I think one thing is that the open batches probably all, not always are meant to be kind of a verifiable in a way that they cannot be falsified and that they capture large amount of information about the learning outcomes, the study modes, what the learner kind of took part. So this, uh, for instance, the EDCs, this, this uh, micro-credential is much about the kind of a quite transparent proof of what the learner has, has actually uh, um, kind of a see, got, got as an outcome, whereas many of the batches are more 
less informal tools. But I'm not saying that some batching solutions couldn't be turned into more verifiable proofs that work also in this kind of a higher education setting. But often the use cases are quite uh, different for each. Thank you. OK, Michael, please. Um, hello, Henry. Um, can I ask you, um, did at the beginning of the um, the your alliance, was there different understanding of what um, micro credentials actually were and, you know, how they would ultimately be presented? Yeah, yes, there were really, really big differences and I think those differences still exist in, may, in many cases because uh, when we started uh, uh, the ECA University project, I think at that time probably many had an impression of MOOCs and some kind of a online content that is not necessarily uh, ECTS based in any way. And some were maybe thinking about like uh, ECTS based offerings that mainly come from the study programs but are just like uh, provided in some different way and I think this kind of a, the conceptual differences I think they are still there and I think they should be because again I'm not sure if in Europe or in general we have identified what's the kind of a, the really unique proposition or the kind of a landscape of what kind of a micro credentials we could have so I think the variety is fine to have but I think it was really hard to discuss them at the start when there wasn't many benchmarks, so to say. Thank you. Any other questions? OK, thank you all for all. Oh, there are Simeon, please. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks Jenny, for the presentation. I'm from the Medical University of Sofia. <clears throat> uh, yeah, we're currently involved in the micro credentials thinking in Genium as well. Uh, but my question was, how easy was it to actually uh, unify all the different uh, universities in, in the alliance in terms of uh, implementing the micro credentials across all universities? Very good question. And I, I think that the, uh, unification hasn't happened and I don't think it in all cases needs to happen. I think it's more about what aspects of micro credentialing are we talking about? Like, uh, I think something about having a common base of learning opportunities. I think that's one. But the other big one was, for instance, which technology we would use for this uh, micro credentialing, what's, which platform and EDC. And uh, there's, you can, if you want to have a look, we have published a couple of papers. Uh, one of my PhD students, Patma Sila Kiskil, has written a couple of papers that kind of document some of that pathway because uh, we did a lot of piloting and we also identified that uh, we cannot unify it and that many of our partner universities wouldn't have those capabilities in house so that we need to do something centrally as an alliance. And uh, so, many different things that cannot, couldn't be unified. But um, I, I recommend to read some of those white papers and then some separate publications that we've tried to document some of that. So hopefully that can be helpful for you. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much for the answer. Thank you. Wonderful. Hey, thank you all for your questions. And thanks once more, Henry, for your time today. Next, we have Kai Weaver, pedagogical specialist, and myself. We will be speaking about ingenious micro credentials and open education. Let's go. So, Kai, please go ahead. Brilliant. So, we're at the beginning stages of planning the creation of ingenious micro credentials. And we are very much speaking about learning opportunities, as Henry said. Uh, we're expecting to start piloting our first micro-credentials next year, so we welcome ideas and feedback at this early stage before we actually start moving forward. The work we have done has been so far to map the Alliance, to understand the possibilities and hurdles that creating joint micro-credentials might face, because there are such divergent regulatory practices and state of play regarding micro-credentials. And we want a firm base to build our joint micro credentials upon that are compliant with national legislation and lean on the strengths of each institution's individual 
and existing practices, but are then enhanced by the diversity available within the Alliance, so that we can start to offer flexible, high-quality micro-credentials that improve the learning pathways for students and develop professional competence for working life within our own countries and beyond. To that end, we've conducted several one-on-one -on -one surveys and interviews with our partner universities to understand the current state of play of micro-credentials and open educational resources within their institutions. I want to thank Juan Reon Gonzalez, Strategic Manager of the Engineering Uni European University, for analysing the results and compiling the findings. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here today. So here you can see the current the results of the survey so far. We've used the traffic light system to show the current state of micro-credential development and legislation within our partner universities. These surveys were used to collect a range of information on a range of issues to understand where we stand and what can be developed and what opportunities we might face and problems we might have. The surveys have shown that partners have very different regulatory frameworks for micro-credentials and that each individual institution's development process is considerably different. Although most partners have some form of lifelong learning offerings, how these are implemented varies considerably from institution to institution. The regulatory frameworks are also very different. Interestingly enough, though, the existence of a regulatory framework that refers directly to micro-credentials does not seem to be a key factor in determining whether a partner institution can implement micro-credentials or not. Recent changes in higher education legislation in EU member states has led to the addition of references and basic principles of micro-credentials in many countries, although none of these seem to offer detailed guidance on their implementation and practice. Like other alliances, Ingenium is trying to navigate the tremendous diversity of European higher education systems, building on the strengths of the different systems available and finding avenues for creating truly joint processes. Some of the interesting findings from our analysis are partners such as ZAMK Finland, Hufte Sweden and MTU Ireland report having a tradition of working with micro-credentials, but no specific legal framework yet at the national level. These are systems with considerable flexibility and autonomy over their education provision. Other partners such as the Medical University of Sofia, Bulgaria, UDA, Italy and Tuasi, Romania report that they do not currently offer micro-credentials. However, UDA Italy does have a lifelong learning offer linked to the three missions of service to society. The creation process also varies for each partner. In some cases, they are identical to the process of creating regular courses included in degree programs. Others, such as Uni Ovi Spain, have completely different and more agile processes. The units responsible for the creation of these micro-credentials also differ between partners, with some having two separate processes, one for students and one for working life. In some cases, these can be under the remit of entirely different ed entities, such as HTA Germany. Yes, and then about quality assurance. The latter difference between institutions, or let me see, yes, no. Uh, quality assurance processes are one of the key aspects in the micro-credentials field, as explained in the European approach to micro-credentials. And today we will hear more about also quality assurance when Michael is talking and giving his presentation. In Ingenium, we see two main approaches to quality assurance of micro-credentials. One that follows the regular course approach and an ad hoc approach to micro-credentials. The latter difference between institutions, as in some cases, such as XAMK, Finland, the quality assurance process is not only about approval of the course or certification, but also considers the continuous improvement of learning material. Our partners are willing to adapt ingenuous quality assurance procedures to enhance their processes and adapt them to the international context. Another interesting thing here is that tuition fees for micro-credentials also prevent large differences between partners. Since Ingenium can use its resources to support the creation of these micro-credentials, fee-based systems can also provide affordable options for learners that also meet Ingenium's inclusion objectives. These systems to determine the, pr the price of micro-credentials or open educational offerings also vary. 
In some cases, the academic coordinators have more leeway, while in others, the fee is determined according to national legislation and institutional policies. We see micro-credentials as providing flexible learning pathways that complement existing degree provisions. For example, in HTA Germany, the courses for degree students are strictly timetabled, and micro-credentials could bring flexibility for their students as a complementary learning mechanism. Creating flexible learning pathways for students that help them develop their transferable skills are at the core of Ingenium's education objectives. Micro-credentials are central to this if they can be integrated into existing degree programs, that is. Asked about their experience and possibility to do so, Ingenium partners reported that although this is not commonly done in their universities, at the moment there are mechanisms to do so. Some partners like HK Germany and Hoof der Sweden have more detailed pathways to do this. One of the elements researched through the survey is the different possibilities for compensating staff for their participation in the design and delivery of micro-credentials. Although these two parts are equally important, especially in the contents of joint creation, having mechanisms to compensate staff for both coordination and teaching can facilitate the design of incentive systems and ensure fair recognition for involvement. At the moment, this compensation seems to only be available in Uniovi, Spain. However, the Medical University of Sofia, Bulgaria, has expressed its intention to do so once its micro credential system is up and running. For other partners, such compensation is usually part of the regular teaching hours or salary. A really positive note comes from the partners' flexibility in different areas related to the joint delivery of micro-credentials. Most partners report being able to pay staff from other engineering institutions to produce or teach a micro-credential. For instance, one engineering university could accredit a micro-credential composed of academic components taught at different institutions and pay the external staff in the delivery thus concentrating only on the administrative responsibilities and sharing the academic ones. Naturally, though, we would love to see the development of truly joint micro-credentials, where all staff are compensated fairly and students have the opportunity to participate. So the challenge then becomes, and it's not a small challenge, with such divergent national legislation and different institutional practices, how do we move towards creating joint ingenium micro-credentials? Well, first, we need to define what an engineering micro-credential is. So most of you are probably familiar with the EU recommendation and some of the best practices from other European university alliances. We've pulled these together to create a definition of our own for micro-credentials. So for us, micro-credentials support professional development and employability. Micro-credentials prove that a learner has completed the required learning outcomes to be certified in a specific topic or skill. They might have completed several courses or had their prior learning recognized. Micro-credentials are short, focused learning experiences that certify specific skills or knowledge. These are not degree programs. Micro-credentials are not the same as courses. Several courses can make up an individual micro-credential, but on the other hand, a single course could also be a micro-credential. Ingenium micro-credentials are transparently produced, flexible and transferable and quality assured. They complement degree studies, but are not necessarily part of any formal education offering. Some are targeted to meet the needs of working life and others to support lifelong learning goals. Engineer micro credentials are open to all Alliance members, though some may charge a fee for specific courses. So now that we have defined what an engineer micro credential is, the question is, how are they delivered? We have developed three types of micro credential delivery, and these are all underpinned by our quality assurance policies, and Michael will go through these later. The first on offer will be a realigned micro-credential, which is the easiest to produce administratively. What we mean by this is that a micro-credential, for example, from Oviedo, Spain, would be updated using the expertise available within the Alliance and realigned with Ingenium's quality assurance policies and good pedagogical practices. In this way, their institutional micro-credential would be enhanced and opened up to the entire Alliance and stakeholders so that we're creating a curated offering. The second option would be a jointly developed micro-credential. Here we would expect to see one or more partners coming together to develop a common curriculum utilizing their diverse expertise. This might be taught simultaneously or in parallel or actually delivered completely autonomously and offered continuously. As part of this jointly developed micro-credential, the partner institutions might decide to jointly accredit this and sign the relevant agreements. A possibility here as well is producing an engineering micro-credential as an open educational resource, 
with all the material included to allow other institutions to be able to deploy it and adapt it within their own contexts. The third model we have is this decentralized micro-credential, which we feel embodies the spirit of our alliance. In this model, different parts of the micro-credential would be taught by different institutions with a leading partner or two coordinating the processes. And this is really crucial while the state of development of micro-credential legislation differs nationally so much. So in this decentralized micro-credential, ZAMP Finland is the lead partner, and they take responsibility for coordinating the individual courses. This example includes courses from Rouen, France, ZAMP Finland, and the Medical University of Sofia, Bulgaria. Each course is developed following the institution's regular processes, but is aligned with other courses in the micro-credential and Ingenium's quality assurance criteria. Each course should be built and developed through cooperation with the other partners involved. Each course and the micro-credential are open to the entire alliance, and the target audience are developed and determined in the beginning. They might be people in the working world, Ingenium students, or the general public with an interest in the topic. Once the individual course is finished, they are awarded ETCS for that course. Once the entire module is finished, the micro-credential is then awarded. In this proposal, our innovation committee assesses the viability of the micro-credential proposal before the creation of learning material has even started, and then approves the final offering. Next, over to Tina, who will speak about the life cycle of a micro-credential. Thanks, Guy. Uh, let me introduce the Ingenium micro-credential life cycle and support model, which consists of three main stages, design, production and finalization. In the design stage, all educational materials are created in alignment with existing institutional practices. We have drafted a micro-credential descriptor to ensure a common standard. While we value, of course, the diversity of educational offerings within the Alliance, we feel it's important that there is a common look, feel and kind of touch about the same things. And once the proposal is ready, it is submitted through the Education Lab portal or proposed straight to the Ingenium Innovation Committee, who will review it and offer feedback to help develop agreements and stuff. Next is the production stage, where materials are developed according to existing institutional procedures. We trust in the individual institution institutions existing practices and their commitment to quality education. It's important, however, that we consider ingenious quality assurance and policies during this stage. For example, we have developed common templates for Moodle, then we have branding and the micro-credential descriptor. In terms of support for content creation, we organize different pedagogical webinars and things like CC licenses and good pedagogical practices. We will offer open courses for the joint educational platform on accessibility and creating educational content, for example. We also have the Education Lab, which is a sort of pedagogical innovative space where partners can create educational material together and receive funding for doing so. Through our Staff Academy program, we are trying to create learning communities for idea sparring and peer support and review also. Then in the finalization stage, the materials are reviewed to ensure alignment with ingenious standards. The innovation committee reviews the micro-credentials as whole and ensures that, that all the boxes are ticked. In addition, this review process will include subject expert and students from the target group. The involvement of students, we see it's really crucial. Once approved, the micro-credentials is published on the Ingenium LMS with periodic updates as needed. And today we will hear Georgios also talking about and telling more about Ingenium LMS. Uh, this life cycle approach to micro-credentials help maintain high quality and cons consistency across Ingenium's educational offerings. Thank you, Tina. And that was it for our introduction to engineering micro-credentials and open education. As we said, we're very much in the beginning stages of planning how they'll look and how they'll come together. So we look forward to a discussion at the end. 
But next, it's my pleasure to be able to welcome Michael Hall, Senior Lecturer, Head of Department and Chairperson of the Quality Assurance Committee at MTU, who will speak more about the Quality Assurance Policy and Micro-Credentials. Over to you, Michael. Okay, thank you, Kai. Um, I'm <clears throat> I'm quite relieved this morning. Um, I'm speaking as I share my document that we all seem to be thinking um, in the, the quite similar um, similar thoughts and similar concepts about um, micro credentials. Um, Okay, um, hello from um, from Rainy Ireland, everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Michael Hall, um, and um, I've just been introduced. Thank you, Kai. The, the I'm um, the, I have a four part presentation, <clears throat> hopefully around fifteen minutes. It's um, I'm going to speak one slide on what micro credentials are. We've already established that um, aligning micro credentials to European QA conventions number two, and um, that, that that has been adequately introduced at this stage as well. Some scenarios that I think might might happen, um, and then the Ingenium Quality Assurance Framework and how it might fit. The aligning micro credentials to European con QA conventions is probably the biggest section in this. Um, I have the the Ingenium Quality Assurance Framework um, would 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 take all morning I think to explain. Although it it um, in concept I think it's fairly straightforward, but maybe that's for another day. Um, and then, sir, and then some. Hey, Michael. Sorry to interrupt. We can sorry. see your PowerPoint, but we can't see the slideshow. Ah, okay. It's not moving. Is that? No. Ah, okay. Just one. Apologies. That's all right. Uh, what? Can you see it moving now? Yes. Now we can. Okay. We see the four-part presentation. Okay. Okay. And can you see part one? Yes. Credentials now. Okay. I won't okay. share. I, I'll. Um, I'll leave it as you see it now. Um, so micro credentials. <clears throat> what are they? Um, small units of learning um, is uh, a term that has been used, and we have heard um, other ter other terms this morning as well. Um, <clears throat> they are distinct from degree programs. Let's say they are short. They are. They could be. We call them modules. Other universities call them courses. They could be individuals. They could be training events. Um, they are teachered. Uh, sorry, structured teaching and learning um, uh, instances, and they lead to an award of uh, in brackets micro credential, but there will be a title to it. Um, the 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 uh, in, in part two in terms of aligning micro credentials to European QA conventions. First of all, what QA conventions? And then I would like to highlight two particular EU funded activities: uh, Microball and the HEA Thematic Peer Group A, which is a working group on micro credentials. Just to uh, to give um, maybe some um, to underpin what has already been said this morning and what I am going to say now. Now. Um, first of all, what European con QA conventions? It's the, the, the Bologna key commitments are a three cycle system, the bachelor, master, doctorate. So micro credentials would ideally fit into those levels um, of, uh, on the quality framework. Um, compliance with Lisbon Recognition Convention, otherwise known as the Council of Europe University Convention, um, and this would be recognition of the award across Europe, uh, respect, respect for the learner, respect for diversity, respect for um, the learning experience, uh, transparency in terms of regulations, in terms of teaching, um, information that is uh, full, clear information, and a diploma supplement, or at least a micro-credential supplement um, that, that, that is an official document to confirm or to accredit uh, the learning. Um, and then QA in compliance with standards and guidelines for quality assurance in the higher education um, area, the ESGs, which means that um, micro credentials should have an internal QA um, uh, aspect. There should be an external, they, they should be amenable to external QA. Um, and then they would fall in some shape or form under the um, oversight of quality assurance agencies. Um, that might not be directly, but it could be indirectly through a university's own uh, quality assurance systems. Um, okay, the, 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 the Microball project um, 
just it's it it, it engaged external stakeholders involved in the Bologna follow, follow up group exploring whether and how existing EHEA tools could be used or could be adapted to to be applicable to micro credentials. Keys to transparency in higher education, particularly with micro credentials in, in this context, would be national quality qualification frameworks, European qualification framework, and ECTS system. Um, I've left the link here for, for anyone who'd like or hasn't read um, uh, this. It's an interesting read. The, um, the, it gave rise to recommendations and guidelines for micro credentials. In the development, for example, involvement of stakeholders in, is important in the design. This is all stakeholders, including academic staff, learners, the quality assurance agencies, employers potentially. Uh, in the design of policies, regulations and tools, so as to ensure or support shared acceptance understanding in the implementation of, of micro-credentials. Um, to that the learning and micro-credentials are based on learning outcomes. Um, <clears throat> to assess the learning um, according to those learning outcomes within micro-credentials. Um, to ensure or to allow flexibility of design so as to um, not uh, not curtail or not prescribe or over prescribe what a micro credential needs to look like and then to um, to allow for the recognition of prior learning um, prospective or uh, re, um, in, in, in advance if you like or into the future of micro credentials so that learners can build upon their learning um, if, my, if learning outcomes will be used, then a national a, a qualifications framework level can be assigned, and this is important. Workload expressed as ECTS um, to ensure comparability, shareability, portability, and understanding of the work that was involved. Quality, um, that is meeting accreditation or award standards, uh, the same standards as effectively as the major awards, that is the same individual um, standards maybe as would be found within major awards. And then a supplement, a micro-credential supplement, for example, a certificate as we have seen with Henry's um, um, presentation this morning, that uh, would be um, a, a badge of quality for the, the, that learning experience. Transparency, of course, with respect to rules and regulations and how those were applied, and then a flexible learning pathway that the micro credential would ideally be part of a flexible learning pathway, not just a once off incident, incident or instance. Sorry. Um, second uh, EU funded element is the EATA thematic peer group A. Um, and this is a working group on micro credentials um, who surveyed uh, stakeholders on how to balance the introduction and implementation of standards and QA principles to micro credentials while still maintaining the flexibility necessary to preserve the um, diversity of micro credentials, which is to be their advantage. And again, it was published in January 2023, and I have the link below. Um, so the main survey conclusions were more targeted and comprehensive regulation in the EHEA area, uh, reference to qualifications frameworks, uniformity leading to better portability, comparability across Europe at least, flexibility, responsiveness, specific skills, um, described in the micro credential and uh, learning needs met for example labor market learning needs and the, the need for greater clarity and consistency in quality assurance um, <clears throat> um, continuing improved stakeholder understanding and support for micro credentials stakeholders here being the learner and the the prospective employer for example continued support and investment in the area, increased international cooperation coordination in the development recognition of micro-credentials to support development of approach to micro-credentials and a more unified approach and widely accepted definitions of what a micro-credential actually is and to raise and, and therefore to raise stakeholder awareness of micro-credentials. 
Um, so if we were to say what are the essential elements um, in, in terms of what, what we're looking at is micro credentials would have flexible design options. They would be relevant in terms of micro, uh, sorry, learning outcomes, uh, learning outcomes describing the learning that is in that micro credential. They are quality assured for enhancement of, of recognition, portability and progression. And there is emphasis on, on progression. Um, 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 I think the um, kind of you use the word stackable elements um, and um, a flexible learning pathway that micro credentials would be part of a pathway. Um, so the part three is just a, a few scenarios just to, to, in terms, I, particularly in the context of Ingenium. Um, and then I will proceed with how that they may link to the Ingenium Quality Assurance um, framework. First of all, scenario one would be a um, micro credential that was designed, approved, delivered, and assessed by one university, offered to students from the various others, uh, um, and that. In, in a sense only requires the host university system, a quality assurance system, um, and assimilation or recognition by other universities would be based on other universities' quality assurance systems. I'd just like to say in this context that there's there's no added value of, the, of an alliance in that, um, in, in that particular scenario, nor is there in this where um, designed, approved, assessed by one member university and co-delivered by two or more members, member universities offered to students in the Alliance, it still means that the host university, one host university QA system will dominate and a system assi assimilation or recognition of results by other universities is again based on those other universities quality assurance systems. Um, however, in terms of a uh, quality um, micro credential designed, approved, delivered, and assessed by two or more member universities of the uh, Ingenium Alliance, that is, multiple universities will contribute grades to a student transcript um, and it is offered to students within the Alliance, then I propose that using the Ingenium QA framework for collaborative provision will allow certain advantages and certainly transparency of operation across the, the, um, the alliance. Um, so some key questions when determining um, the, the quality assurance fit, if you like, for um, micro credentials would be how many universities will approve the micro credentials how many universities will assess learners achievement how are the assessments results managed and how many universities will award the micro credential um some others what is the micro credential is it a module some you you call it a course is it a minor award is it a short is it is it a short learning experience or is it something else so it's defined um, is it credit weighted? Is there are there learning outcomes, or what is the credit weighting? What are the learning outcomes? What is the approval process? Who owns the micro credential? How is it written and presented? Who is delivering the micro credential? Who is assessing it? Does it lead to an award? Is that award a joint award? So, in terms of initial um, uh, uh, conversations around this, these would be, I would suggest, important questions. And these are questions that are guided by, are intended to be guided by at least the Ingenium Quality Assurance Framework. Um, now, the Quality Assurance Framework, we have the framework document itself for collaborative provision, and we have associated guideline documents uh, for the design and development, for the delivery, for the assessment, for the monitoring and review. These are not intended to be prescriptive documents. They are guidelines as to what are the factors, what are the, the criteria that should be taken into account when designing, developing, delivering and so on. And they are intended to ensure consistency of approach to design and development, to delivery and so on. Um, there is one other document still in draft. This is work package two um, of Ingenium. Uh, one, more, one more document in draft and that is uh, how to use the, the, the entire system. Um, and that's in draft and under review at the moment. There are four parts to the quality assurance framework. Expression of uh, intent for the collaboration, initial arrangements, the processes involved, and then the agreement. 
Um, and again, these are guidelines as a framework. Express expression of intent can be through the Ingenium calls for collaboration process coordinated by Work Package 4 um, or individual um, conversations, for example, with partners. Ultimately, they'll have to go back into Ingenium for approval or recognition. Um, but responses um, and then initial exploratory meet ex ex responses to a call, for example, and initial exploratory meetings to establish partners involved in the scope of collaboration is important part of this first step in um, um, generating or conceiving um, a, 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 um, micro credential. Um, the next is the initial arrangements. Initial arrangements we proposed would be the recognition of strategic fit, that there are st strategic policies in place that cover or support the micro-credentials delivery by th those university partners, a formal letter of intent or approval by the university to proceed, identification of a QA body or committee or bodies to approve um, the new micro, the, the new program, uh, identification of personnel involved, online learning platform, associated training and access, and of the accessibility of policies and procedures. These are, and I, I just repeat, these are not the policies and procedures, just how, where they will be for the, the development team and delivery team to access. Um, the collaborative provision process will guide, will, will um, explain that there should be processes in place for the design and approval for delivery assessment for ongoing monitoring and periodic review um, in, in order to ensure, um, as, with the, as is the purpose of the framework, that the micro-credential or any other academic programme will comply with European, um, the European approach, if you like, with the European expect quality assurance expectations and other information can be specific uh, regulations, they can be complaints, they can be appeals, they can be student rights and, and so on that may be relevant and probably uni university wide documents. And finally then the consortium agreement. The consortium agreement is the <clears throat> identifies the who, the what, the why and the how of the collaboration. Um, it is intended to be an instruction manual it's intended to, be, to describe the steps involved, how to do this, how to do that. It is intended to guide uh, due diligence, uh, financial risk, uh, reputational risk, stakeholder involvement, and so on um, of, the, of the project. Alignment and management of procedures, sorry, how um, um, procedures and regulations and so on are, are from different um, universities are to be aligned and managed. This is, there may be particular um, legislative uh, requirements for one university that are, don't exist for others. And these, um, how these might be managed within the development process would be, would be described here. And then detailed quality assurance procedures for design, development, approval. And I think these uh, delivery assessment award and review. Um, I think at this stage, th this could be a combination of inputs from from the different work uh, ingenium work packages um, because I believe these a lot of these will exist anyway. Um, there will be appendices, any relevant documentation, and there will be specific ancillary processes as, as required. Um, so in terms of conclusion then, the micro-credentials in, in the context of QA compliance would be defined by uh, learning outcomes. Um, the new skill set will be defined by learning outcomes. There will be reference to a qualifications framework. They'll be credit weighted, they'll be assessed and a certificate provided. Um, and <clears throat> obviously where there is um, uh, collaborative, collaborative provision on these, we would like that the uh, quality, the Ingenium quality assurance framework um, will be employed. Okay, and then finally, just the, uh, for all, in terms of benefits of QA compliance, if it was needed uh, for all stakeholders, recognition and portability. For learners, it's the confidence of the product, defined skill set, competence assessed, recognition um, by across Europe, for example, and progression or stackability of awards. Um, for higher education institutions, it will be the clarity from the QA policy and procedures, the standards will be defined, and stakeholder expectations, learner expectations, for example, are managed, are manageable. And for employers, it is the confidence again in the product, the quality of the product, and the defined skill set. 
So thank you very much. That's that's my presentation and my thoughts. OK, thank you, Michael, for going through the QA policy. It's really inter interesting to see and great to see that these are really aligned with each other, what we have been working on. Uh, do you have any other comments or questions for Michael? I think we have next uh, speaker already there. So uh, welcome Georgios Chalkiadakis, Digital Governance Unit Head. He will be talking about Ingenium Digital Platform and Open Science. Over to you. Okay, I guess you can hear me now. Yes, we can. Wonderful. Uh, and can I you... ask my question first? Yes. The previous speaker. Uh, okay, this is George from uh, University of Crete. Uh, you mentioned something about recognition of prior learning. How do you do that in terms of life, uh, lifelong learning? I think that's a really good question. The the um the in 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 principle any form of lifelong learning or um, informal learning or uncertified learning should be um the, uh, the higher education institutions universities should be able to recognize that as learning so that the learner doesn't have to learn it twice. Um, it's in in terms of the context here. What I felt was that the uh, number one, the micro credential would be recognized as valid learning and therefore would be stackable, would be recognizable across Europe or across universities. So as to build on, allow the, 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 the student to build on what they have learned already and not have to, for example, repeat the learning that was learned in a micro credential in a bigger program. It would just be recognized as such. In the bigger, in the bigger, picture, I suppose, is that perhaps if specific learning was, uh, if, if a learner had already a skill set which was described by a micro-credential, that they could seek recognition of their prior learning and be awarded that micro-credential. That's a bigger question, though, and it's, it, it, would, it would require the, the, a clear definition of what the micro-credential was and what it intended to be, um, as well as a very careful RPL, the recognition of prior learning policy. Not sure if that helps to explain. OK, thank you. Thank you. And now, Georgios. Okay. Your turn. Welcome. I'm share my screen. Okay. Uh, I am not going to uh, be talking about uh, micro credentials, uh, but instead I'm going to be talking about uh, LMS uh, systems, open data, and open science. This is the agenda I'm going to be talking about. Uh, those are the definitions and which I'm going to try and clarify just a little bit. Uh, starting with the open education. I'm reading, I'm reading out the definition. It's all about making learning more accessible, flexible, and inclusive. It involves using resources freely available online and breaking down barriers like cost and geographical locations. OK. Uh, if we have been talking, we're going to be talking about educational resources, uh, and since here we are universities, we're going to be talking about teaching, learning, and research materials freely available for anybody to use. About the open courses, the infamous MOOCs, uh, or courses available online, like uh, lifelong life, uh, learning, and also about collaborative learning, open. Uh, promoting uh, interactive learning uh, for students and educators. Going on, I'm going to be talking about open data. Uh, I have to, uh, to let you know that we have an open data site available through the Ingenium platforms, and um, each university has its own space. Hopefully, in the near future, uh, 
lecturers, uh, staff and faculty from the universities, they're going to be uploading stuff on our open data platform. Now, why use open data? Accessibility, uh, reuse and dist redistribution uh, with a common format. Sorry, just to interrupt, we can only see your PowerPoint. We can't see the presentation. I'm sorry. Am I OK now? Can you see it? Yes, now we can. We can see the definition right. slide and open education. Course, Brilliant. On the slide of open data, what open data provides. Actually, this that was the format. And the open data provides transparency, innovation and growth, improved services. And as an example, it's the government data, scientific and environmental. Actually, in Greece, with the government data and the open data, we're doing well. And I got to say this. Now, the scientific data, which is us, universities, um, not too well. Uh, Researchers are uh, reluctant to publish or to upload something on the open data platforms, but we keep trying. Open science, again, this is the definition uh, to make scientific and research data available to everybody. Uh, that's not going very well, if you ask me. We should have more open, open data available for the scientists. Uh, the, key, the key principles using open data for open science would be open access, open source, and open reviews, and also engaging the general public. Now the benefits, and I'm going uh, right here, the, the transparency, the collaboration, and the innovation. Um, the examples of open science in action would be the public repositories, just, just like ours, the, the uh, Ingenium open data platform, but also more publicly known like Zenodo uh, and uh, ARXIV. Now, the learning management system, what is it? This is the main point of what I'm, I'm going to be talking about. Just, this is just a basic tool uh used uh especially to do uh lecturing uh it's it's basically a platform designed to manage deliver and uh do educational and training programs we've been using it for years not only in our university but throughout europe um, and it's going well We've been using it in our university for lifelong learning system for our courses. Now, why this is important? Because it's a very basic tool leading to or used by lecturers to uh, award or the universities to award micro credentials. It's the easiest thing to do. It can be uh, you, what you can do with that course management, user management, and collaboration tools. In other words, you have a global class. And by using this, you can award, you can do assessment, uh, do tracking and analytics. Okay. And then you have the certification. The certification is micro credentials or something like that. Uh, and then you can personalize and customize all that according to your uh, quality assurance, the national quality assurance, your uh, local uh, university quality insurance or ingenium quality insurance. And if we categorize by type, you have the academic LMS, you have the corporate LMS, which is uh, more complicated and uh, the standalone or the integrated systems. Uh, now, in our case, we do have an LMS platform and we chose Moodle uh, for that. And uh, I believe we gave so far two courses, two open courses. Uh, our decision is to give open courses uh, or seminars and then courses through the Ingenium registry. 
and that it's going to be leading to uh, microcredentials. Now, what is EU doing about it? That's the European initiative related to the uh, learning management system. And that's the model, the learning model, ELM, aimed to standardize and facilitate the recognition of qualification and digital credentials across Europe. Uh, if we we'll go on, we'll see, this is the Digital Education Action Plan 21 to 27. Outlines the vision for high quality, inclusive and accessible digital education across Europe. Now, if we go to this, this uh, uh, slide and the next one, I'm talking about the, feature, the features of the ELM, which is multilingual and provides interoperability, versatility, and support for life to, lifelong learning. Plus, it's a part of the Europass framework uh, and contributes to, to the European Skills Agenda, the European Education Area, and the Digital Education Plan. Okay, our Ingenium Learning Management System. Uh, we're going to be offer courses, offering courses through the Moodle e-learning platform to students and all members of the university community. The courses divided into open access courses anyone can attend without registration and courses that require enrollment and approval. That's through our registry. This is that the second tool we're going to be using for our um, university, which is the registry. This is not a part of this discussion. Uh, in addition to offering standard courses, the platform is capable of delivering seminar level courses and integrates with micro credential application and badges. Uh, the participants can utilize in the future for professional recognition. As you see, uh, and that's that's the main point, the the, uh, the LMS platform is just a tool leading to the micro credential when you award something like a micro credential or a badge or something a link it to the market because the micro credentials lead or you upload the credentials to a badge open or digital and that's been connected to the market the market goes on the platform and sees or uh, can see what you are capable of doing that's why i, I was asking before about the prior uh, recognition of a topic because if I am a uh, let's say an a corporation I would like to get somebody that knows this next to this prior to this and stuff like that that's the stackable micro credential and if I was a CEO in a or a personnel something human resources manager in a company I would like my um, uh, future employees to have several micro credential or several skills to employ them. I thank you. Any questions? Okay, thank you, Georgios. Uh, it's great to see that how this, what work you have been doing with the digital pat platforms, and this makes the implementation of micro credentials uh, and other open educational resources possible in the future. I think, like Georgios, we were saying that if there are any questions, I think this could be the great time. We have a couple of minutes left. So if you have questions, you can ask from all the presenters who still are at the webinar. And we will give you rights to open your mic. Raise your hand if, if you wish to say something. Michael, please. Yes, my, my hand slipped, but um, <laughs> I'd like to, uh, I'd, can I can I say that it would be it, it, it is. Th thank you for the for the webinar. I think it's been really interesting and the other speakers have been really interesting. I, I think it is a good time to begin to <clears throat> to look at 
um, the relevant work package teams beginning to talk to each other about their products and how their products now seem to be converging towards a, a point where collaboration or joint discussions are really important. Um, I know some have happened already, but <clears throat> I think the in terms of um, the, the micro credentials and the future of micro credentials um, in terms of the quality assurance, the platform, the, the, the structure of those, um, it's, it, it will be an interesting and diverse discussion, but I think it's an essential one to happen very soon. Thank you, Michael, for your comments. Any other? Eva, please. I just wanted to, to thank all, all the presenters uh, that this, this webinar was uh, very, very useful. And I totally agree with the Michael that now we, we need to even make make more tighter collaboration together with these different kind of kinds of elements so that the resu results we are achieving will be perfect in the future thank you very much for organizing this and all the participants thank you eva um, i think um, these words what we have now heard uh, it's time to thank you all for today's webinar I would like to extend my gratitude to all our speakers for sharing their knowledge and experience with us. Thank you. I think Anna is maybe already left, but thank you, Anna. Same to Henry, Kai, Michael and Georgios. And also, of course, I would also like to thank everyone who participated in the webinar. And for sure, let's continue to collaborate together. And thank you once again for your time and contribution. And I think it's time to say it. have a wonderful day. <laughs> thank you.